Yeah, Judge, I, I could have taken advantage of your offer to accelerate my question, but I come up to the mic quite often. I want to make sure everybody else got in. And, uh, and, uh, but it does allow me to introduce myself, as I do on the Vala conspiracy, as a devil's advocate, because one thing that occurs to me is despite the kind of Churchillian uh, uh, kind of I idiom that you gave to cost-benefit analysis, analysis Susan, I'm, I'm wondering if this isn't all uh, an excuse for avoiding the real issue I thought was at play in ATA, which was, was non-delegation. I mean, ultimately, I feel like cost-benefit analysis should be accomplished by the voter at the ballot box and that if they pass a Clean Air Act that's incredibly stifling to the economy and a poor piece of policy choice, we should vote them out of office, not try and think of devious ways to employ the executive if he happens to be on our side to help us out a little. Well, maybe I, I should, I'll let lawyers respond to this, but <laughs> I, I'll have one example. Um, the ATA case was about national ambient air quality standards and the court ruled, and I think Daryl mentioned this briefly, that EPA had to protect human health and welfare with an adequate margin of safety, and that means you can't consider costs. So you have this um, bizarro world where the administrator, EPA, the staff is doing analysis of the costs and benefits of the regulation. The administrator of EPA cannot look at that analysis when he makes his decision. He has to make his decision on purely health factors. Well, what does that mean um, for most of these pollutants? The, the dose response curve goes, you know, the dose makes the poison, goes from here down to zero. So at any minute level, there is some health effect. So how do you protect health with an adequate margin of safety if you have to go to below zero, mm -hmm. um, if you actually read the statute? So I actually, in um, telling tales out of school, I propose that we, on the lead ambient air quality standard last year, that we set it at zero. Let's say the emperor has no clothes. Let's say you cannot do it because it's a charade that science, without considering trade-offs, can make that decision. And then let's let Congress, force Congress to decide, is this really what we meant? Um, I didn't succeed. <laughs> um, I, 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 I tried to suggest in my <laughs> quickly reversed opinion yes. in ATA that that was exactly what mm -hmm. the, the prevailing DC Circuit law Supreme Court uh, would produce. Uh, but somehow or other, the Supreme Court seemed to think that it could give it this interpretation of precluding cost benefit analysis without confronting that dilemma. So that's one of the many things I don't understand in the law. <laughs> um, I mean, one, I think your question also gets you, I mean, the, 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 uh, there is that kind of specific case, but in, in general, we do let agencies do cost benefit analysis. And it's very unlikely that we're gonna go to a system where Congress is making all the decisions all the time. We just live in vastly too complex of a society. The, the um, delegation of broad authority and broad discretion to administrative agencies is, is here to stay. I, I, I would be, I mean, I don't think anyone's really talking about anymore um, that going away in the mainstream. Um, and so given that reality, the question becomes how should that discretion be exercised? It could be unformed kind of political calculations made by um, um, just by bureaucrats, or we could have a structure to, to uh, create some mechanism for them to uh, to actually exercise their authority. And I think that's why you see a lot of um, folks in favor of at least some form of cost benefit analysis is we have a lot of discretion vested in administrative agencies. So let's have that discretion exercised in a reasonable way. Yeah, and, and, by the way, please stay and ask more questions because it's getting a little more interesting now. <laughs> no. uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, from the legal perspective, I think there are two things. One is, if, if Congress is clear, if, if Congress really says something, then fine. Uh, but more often than not, it does not. Um, you know, most of these statutes, there is ambiguity, and therefore the agency has to follow through with it. And as, you know, as Susan and, and Judge Williams were saying, uh, the notion that an agency can, can do something in most of these areas without at least implicitly weighing costs against benefits is, is a charade. Because if all you really cared about was health, then you would set all these air quality standards at zero. Um, and so the reason you haven't set them at zero is you're weighing that against something else. And that something else is the disadvantages of going lower. And so there's, what you do is you take what would otherwise be a more transparent and, and rational decision-making process um, and, and force it underground in ways that just can't be good. 
Well, nobody ever accused me of being in the mainstream, <laughs> but, uh, but I do wonder why we've lost track of a model. I, I certainly agree Congress is entitled to the counsel of, of technocrats and experts and, and bureaucrats within the administration. I think we've just lost touch with a model where Congress w would delegate to them the, the task to come back with an appropriate standard where Congress would still have to take responsibility for it, approve it, and not and not be allowed to play the kind of shell game with, uh, uh, with some of these laws that I, that I think they do, saying they cleaned the air and saying at the same time they were considerate of jobs or whatever. This is the, they, they have all the rhetoric, and then you know, the hard work falls. And, and, and I agree, people have done reasonable things with cost-benefit analysis, and it, and it implicitly applies virtually all the time anyway. But uh, I'm, I'm just sorry that, that coming out of ATA, uh, although it was a nine to nothing clocking, so I guess we're supposed to let it go away. I still, I still maintain that delegation matters. Well, having reversed nine zip, uh, <laughs> tend to share your view. <laughs> um, it seems to be a momentary pause. I, I, I did have a question. I'm not sure exactly how to formulate it. It relates to behavioral economics and also the issue of, of rationality, which Susan raised, I think, in part in connection with that. Uh, I mean, a, a premise of behavioral economics, I mean, a finding of behavioral economics is that people often act irrationally. And I think um, uh, you, have to give, you have to give huge uh, primacy to heuristic devices to, to somehow or other get around that conclusion. Uh, and maybe even with them, you aren't successful in getting around it. But so let's let's take that as a given. Uh, wh what does that tell us about the governmental decisions? I mean, is there is there a premise that the people making the governmental decisions are exempt from these irrationalities? And and if we couple, if if we we entertain the possibility that they're not exempt, uh, and if we add in rent-seeking pressures, uh, where are we left? I'll take a, fir a first crack at that. I think that, you know, obviously the public choice problem, and then I think no, uh, there's very few folks I think that would argue that, you know, just as it would be hard to argue that. Um, regular people in the marketplace are always perfectly rational, that people in the bureaucratic situations are perfectly rational. One of the things that uh, uh, Administrator Sunstein does in his book Nudge is he, d he does kind of try to parse out those situations where we think systematically um, people are going to be most subject to heuristics or other kind of behavioral quirks that will affect their decision making. And in those kinds of contexts, we think maybe government folks will have um, they, they won't face the same kind of problem. So for example, um, yeah, situations where people make decisions only infrequently, right? So they only make a decision once or twice in their life. So they can't build up a history of experience um, with making that kind of consumer decision. Is a situation where you some, some, sometimes uh, people are more subject to behavioral quirks. Whereas if you make a decision kind of every day or every week or even every year, that's the kind of decision that you can learn from your mistakes. You can accept the consequences of maybe past failures, and then you, you will systematically improve your decision making. And in those kinds of situations, governments won't have those kinds of problems because they can look uh, on a more aggregated level at the um, at the decisions, and so and they can gain expertise in the kind of decision that it is. So that's at least that's one context where we might think that government folks have have some advantages over individuals in the marketplace. I thought, though, that the question was what, what would happen if you had a, a government of irrational people with bad motives, and I was going to say you'd have the United States Congress. <laughs> <laughs> I, I certainly would never impute a co such things to a coordinate branch. 